Well, we speak today about the scriptures regarding doctrinal error as the entry into open fellowship error, a series we have begun about, well, open fellowship error. So uh, here I wanted to lay out what the Bible says fairly plainly about doctrinal error, the teaching of things that are false in the name of God. And um, the first thing that comes to mind here is that we ought to decide on a definition of the word peace. Uh, open fellowship error is really based on the idea we can get along, um, if you will, we can have peace with one another, and that this is the most desirable thing. Um, if it's positively formulated. Now, of course, uh, the real underpinnings of open fellowship error is a basic disbelief in Scripture. They do not believe that the Bible can be understood. And so they have to come up with some other way in which we can agree with one another since we cannot have unity on the basis of understanding the Bible if the Bible cannot be understood. So that's always in the back of the mind when you look at these things. But if they're going to formulate it in a positive way, they would say, well, this is for peace, and we are for peace and for unity. So now we go back to Jeremiah 6, and let us define peace from the Bible. Let the Bible define peace, I should say. In Jeremiah 6, 14 and 15, they have healed the wound of my people lightly, says the prophet, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So the people are wounded by the error, and there is a superficial healing, a, a lightly, uh, uh, you know, healing the wound lightly, which is to say it's only superficial or perhaps the um, bandage that they have provided for that uh, limb that has been cut off is not sufficient. <laughs> That's not going to work. They're saying peace when there isn't peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, not at all ashamed. They didn't even know how to blush. This is why they fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they will be overthrown, says the Lord. So it's important to understand that God's definition of peace may not be our definition of peace. And there certainly is documented, at least in this instance, and probably you could cite several others, where the prophets were calling something peace that was not peace. The people were calling something peace that God did not recognize as peace. And there's coming a time, as he says, when they will fall. There's coming a time when they will be punished. And it will be because of this false peace, this false teaching, saying that there is peace, but there isn't. Well, there might have been peace between people, but peace with God is the thing we need to be concerned about. First of all, then you go, say, to Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus says, rather plainly, 34 to 39 of Matthew 10, something that is perhaps surprising or shocking to hear. But he says, do not think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And you know, there are so many, um, especially at this time of year, you start to see the greeting cards and the signs and uh, hear songs and things, people talking about peace on earth, goodwill to man, you know. And this is a, a misnomer. It's true that God does bring peace, but it's peace with him through the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, when we repent of our sins and come into conformity to his teaching. It's not the kind of peace they're thinking of, and that's why Jesus said what he did here, and this is probably as well, why it is perceived as shocking sometimes. Do not think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. 
And whoever loves father or mother more than he loves me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than he loves me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Back on this idea of whoever loves mother or father more than me is not worthy of me, we can say very plainly that often people are reluctant to study the Bible or reluctant to um, contemplate the truth because doing so would condemn their parents who brought them up in a different way, in a different tradition, in a different religion or belief system. And they don't want to condemn their parents especially if their parents have already gone on from this life. Well, the scriptures tell us that it, even if that has happened and if they have lost their souls, what they want for you is for you to obey the gospel, not do what they did. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This is to do with uh, people compromising. They'll go to congregations that they know are not sound or faithful or strong because there's lots of young people there's lots of kids who can be friends with my kids and they think to themselves that this kind of friendship and these kinds of relationships are essential for the children the problem is doing that puts the children in front of the god god should be served first what your children need is for you to stand strong and for you to be faithful to the truth for you to uphold the word. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So we all have to suffer. We all have to sacrifice. We all have to work. That's the idea. Okay. The next one is Psalm 34. When we say define peace. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Psalm 34 begins, or our passage begins, verse 12. Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. So like we read earlier, there are those who will be cut off, who will fall at the time of falling. And it will be on them, not on God. And Jesus says, you must take up your cross and follow me, otherwise you're not worthy of me. God is never begging us to become disciples of his. He is telling us what the cost is and that the price is worth it. But he's telling us what the cost is. And here in the psalm, if you desire life, if you love many days, if you want to see good, here is what you do. You live in such a way that you turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Understanding the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, his ears toward their cry. Well, eyes and ears are typically considered part of the face, you know. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. To cut off the memory of them from the earth. So that even their memory of them will not be around. This is just a quick summary, if you will, um, to this point. This is just a quick summary of God's definition of peace. <laughs> what constitutes peace? And you know, it, it's also uh, showing us things that people typically think of as peace that uh, compete with God's definition. So the next question, in my mind anyway, um, and, you know, if it's not your next question, you can, you know, get your own lesson. But what does God say about error is the next thing. <laughs> well, what is peace, right? Well, we got that. Now, what does God say about error? Well, he does have some things to say about that, but I've picked um, Ephesians 5 as the best example 
or compilation of things for us to consider. In Ephesians 5 at verse 3, for example, it says sexual immorality, any impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. So the sanctified, the holy, those who have repented and left this world and this way of life have died to sin should no longer live in it. Fornication, the impurity, the desire uh, for things or things that don't belong to you, covetousness, these shouldn't even be named among you as is appropriate for the saints. The children of God should not be living in these things, that, that you cannot be right with God and live in these things. And he tells us at verse 5, you may be sure of this, everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or covetous, which is equivalent to idolatry, everyone who is like that has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers or partners with them. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. That's 5 through 8. Let me go back just a bit here. He says... This is a thing you can be sure of. We don't have fornication. We don't have impurity. We don't have covetousness named among us. We put that aside because you can be certain everybody who is in fornication, impurity, or covetousness is an idolater. But everyone who is in that has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So if this is something that the saints are practicing, if this is something that a Christian is walking in, this Christian has lost his or her inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Their, their soul is lost. Then he follows it up after saying, you can be sure about that. Let no one deceive you with empty words. This is what error is. <laughs> False teaching is deceptive the deception of empty words they sound good um, they're plausible perhaps and convincing but the fact is you know it is because of such things as this that the wrath of god comes on the sons of disobedience if you do not obey if, if you are you know of a character you know the sons of disobedience you're a character who will not obey who will not listen and you're following this kind of empty talk, empty promises, um, you're going to lose your soul. He's saying, look, you, it's because of these things that wrath comes. See, error, false teaching, makes these things okay somehow. Somehow argues that you can marry multiple times or that, um, you know, you can use some drugs, you know, whatever the drug of the day is, whatever is popular, or whatever it is, you know, they will go down this path of enabling things that you know with surety disqualify you from the kingdom. So however they're saying it, however they're getting there, however plausible these arguments may be, you know in the end that there's no way to practice these things and be right with God. If that's what the teaching leads to, it's error. That is a false teacher. Do not be partakers or partners with them, he said. At one time you were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So we don't partake. We're, we're not partners with people who teach that there is a way to commit fornication. There's a way to uh, hold the covetousness. You, you, we have nothing to do with that. In fact, in the 11th verse, he said, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Instead, expose them. It's shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. Yeah. Well, 11 and 12 here of Ephesians 5 are probably the more famous ones, but take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. This take no part, you know, partnership, this share, this, uh, yeah, partnership, collaboration kind of idea that word 
is the word that is usually defined as fellowship. Your fellow workers in this effort, that's fellowship. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Instead, expose them or take no part in it. As he said earlier, do not be partners with them in this. The proverb says, do not envy sinners. In fact, not only do we refuse to take part, we even expose them. Which is to say, they are to be identified. It's shameful to speak of things they do in secret, and that is true. Um, well, yeah. There are so many terrible things in the world, but so among the more terrible statistics um, that you hear is around, you know, uh, around large events like Formula One that we have here in Austin. When Formula One comes to town, human trafficking goes up, prostitution goes up dramatically. So it's shameful to speak of the things they do in secret. And I'm not saying it's wrong to be an F1 racer or to enjoy F1 racing. Well, that might be a little bit wrong, but, you know. <laughs> um, I'm saying when people have the ability to do something, when they have the ability to hide something, they do some terrible, terrible things. That's all we're getting at. If there were light shed on this, if everybody could see what was going on and know who was doing what, you would not see the human trafficking and the prostitution that you do see. If you knew the, the wealthy people and the, the uh, famous names who were in attendance, who were the reason that these things spiked, that would be a problem for them. That's all we're saying. That's what he means here. Not that we're out to make problems, but that light is good. Exposure is good. A Christian has nothing to hide. The Christian has the truth. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, 15. So be careful about how you walk. This is the attitude of God towards it. You know, too many times I think people are just lackadaisical about it. Like, eh, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm not as bad as others kind of thinking. But you got to look carefully how you walk. It does matter the choices that we make. I think the worldly attitude is, yeah, it's just a bunch of hubbub about nothing. You know, you're, you're just being too strict or too harsh or whatever. The fact is that how we serve God matters and whether we're right with God matters and the things that are important to God may not be the things that are important to man as a rule. It is up to you as a godly person to make God's things important to you. You choose to prioritize him. All right. So what we're picking up here from Ephesians 5 what does God say about it? Well, one of the things he says about this is to identify and remove it. He said we are not partakers, we are not partners, we expose it. But remember the earlier readings, how he said, therefore they will fall at the time that I judge them, says the Lord, Jeremiah 6, and other things to uh, the Psalm 34, to blot out the memory of them. There is a follow-through from God, not just to identify, but also to remove. So, we'll read through a few verses here. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Can you imagine that in the days of the apostles, there were already false prophets in number? who had gone out everywhere. I think about this whenever I hear somebody say, I wish that Paul could be here to answer this question for us, or I wish that John could answer this, or you know, if we could just ask Jesus or the apostles this, this question. Um, you know, that's just not true. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They never said anything that isn't recorded here. They didn't have anything to say 
other than or over and above what has been written. So if you can't figure it out from this, their personal presence would not help you either. Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they're from God. This is back to what he said earlier. Do not be unwise. Consider carefully how you walk. Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits. Many false prophets have already gone out. That's true. Romans 16, 17, of course, another place. But here the apostle says, I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the teaching or the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. So there's an identification here. If you're going to test the spirits to see whether they're from God, and you know that there's lots of false ones that went out, you know that means you're going to identify them. In Romans 16, 17, he's very plain about this. Watch out for them. That means you have to identify them. And if you look at the rest of the chapter, you can see that Romans 16 is written, if you will, in the audience or in the hearing of all the churches of Rome. There are many churches named in the verses leading up to this one. And the 16th verse said, all the churches of Christ greet you, which is not a bumper sticker. It means they say hi. All the churches where Paul has been send their greeting to you. Which sets the stage, if you will, or sets the scope of what he says to all the churches. When it comes time and you realize that somebody is teaching error and somebody is causing division and creating obstacles that are contrary to the teaching, they must be avoided, but also you got to watch out, meaning we have to tell people about it. That's what that means. It's in the hearing of the churches. If it's going to be named, it needs to be named. It needs to be identified so that people know and so that they don't take that in in the next place, wherever this person might go. Galatians 1 uh, is another such passage about identify and remove the error. Verses 6 through 9, the apostle said, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. And you're quickly turning to a different gospel. Not that there really is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we've already preached, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. If we, or an angel from heaven, he said. <laughs> what authority are you going to cite? <laughs> if we, or an angel from heaven, preach a gospel contrary to the one preached, let him be accursed. You know what let him be accursed means? This is anathema. And what's anathema? Well, ana is up, and thema, or theme, is written. Written up. Uh, that means that they have their sign on the wall. <laughs> They have their picture on the wall of the post office is what that means. <laughs> um, if somebody is preaching a gospel contrary to the one that we have already received in the scripture, that one is to be written up. Meaning that it needs to be known who that is. That is effectively a spiritual outlaw. This is identification for the purpose of removal. And it doesn't matter who it is. Too often people are caught up in uh, in identities, you know, uh, personalities. Somebody that they know or have known for many years. And, oh, he did these great things for me. Or, as one said, I suspect that they uh, admire his life and respect his uh, wisdom of experience and years. Okay, but that has nothing to do with the fact that he teaches error on marriage and divorce and remarriage. That's immaterial. Of course, they get something right. It wouldn't be palatable if they didn't. If they want to go in this way, you let them go on without you. The other thing that God says about error, 1 Timothy 1 verse 20, is an example of use names. P. 
people are afraid to use names. They don't like to name names because that's where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> that's when you really understand what we're talking about. And yet, when you read the New Testament, the apostles did it all the time. First Peter 1, I'm sorry, First Timothy 1, verse 20, he said, among those who are doing wrong are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. They've suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith, is what it's saying. There are names associated with this. They're known to the apostle. They're known to others who are in that area, if you will. And he's telling Timothy, watch out, if you will. These have been handed over. They must learn not to blaspheme. They need to come back to the Lord. But then, you know, in the second letter, there's a difference. You still got Hymenaeus. But now Philetus, their talk spreads like gangrene, which is cancer. Gangrene and cancer are the same thing. Among them, in, in Greek, I mean. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Here they're spreading doctrine that is error. But you get the idea. The names are being used. Further in Timothy, in 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, he names uh, four different individuals here. Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Which means they all deserted him. Demas deserted him and went to Thessalonica. Crescens deserted him and went to Galatia. Titus desert, deserted him and went to Dalmatia. And in the fourth case, at verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Is it the same Alexander he wrote about in the first letter? Possibly. You see a change in character for Hymenaeus from 1 Timothy to 2 Timothy. In 1 Timothy, he suffered shipwreck. In 2 Timothy, he's overthrowing the faith of other people. But regardless, the point of this is the example that God used their names. In Galatians 2, verse 11, Peter, or I'm sorry, Paul withstood Peter. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. So in public, he made known that Paul had done wrong, or I'm sorry, that Peter had done wrong. Peter, for his part, later in life, in 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16, remembers it, but understands that it's right. He said, 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16, count the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. All his letters, does that include Galatians? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he knows what Galatians says. He knows what he did. But he's repentant. And yeah, it's wrong, and it needs to be recorded. It's useful for teaching. He's accepting this. There are some things, he continues, in the letters of Paul that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. So even here he warns us. You would think that Peter could have a personal grudge against Paul for having stood up against him like this and named him and written it down in a letter that got circulated among all the brethren. But no, no, he called him our beloved brother Paul, right? The patience of our Lord is salvation, as our beloved brother Paul also wrote. And that's true. Peter could have died in that sin, but he was rebuked by Paul. Paul may well have saved his soul. That's the patience of the Lord. So no, he did not have a personal grudge. He did not have an axe to grind. Uh, even though his name was used, it was used appropriately. It was accurate. It was according to God's plan that it be so. And he is repentant, thankfully. The other thing that we can draw from these is that God wants us to beware compromise. In 2 Timothy, also in chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 tell us the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching 
But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. I chuckle a little bit because Emily brought this up this morning when we were... One of the dogs has an ear infection. <laughs> so we're putting the medicine on inside the ear and you're supposed to like massage the ear. Um, you know, when you do this to kind of spread it around or whatever, it's, she's better at it than, than I am. I, you know, I, I tend to use my fist, but um, <laughs> not really. <laughs> but he loves it. That's the funny thing about it. This dog, you rub it in his ears and he is rolling around just grunting and snorting. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, but she talked about this passage with regard to that, I realized, you know, it's true. He loves it. He wants you to come over there and deal with these itching ears. And this is how God describes people who want error. They love it. They, they love it when somebody can come and speak and be so eloquent, um, so convincing, whatever it is that they're looking for. They just, that's the thing for them. They love it. Sometimes people wonder where do false teachers come from? You know, and there's this myth that he's like the Pied Piper of, of Hamelin. That, you know, he comes from nowhere, just rides into town with the intent of stealing your children, uh, tricks everybody and, and all, you know. No, that's not true. The Bible tells you where they came from. It's this verse right here. The people will not endure sound teaching. Having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. That's where they come from. Where do the false teachers come from? They come from the support mechanism of the church. They're the guys who can get money. <laughs> Their support requests are accepted. Their checks, you know, arrive. They get paid to do this. That, that's what's being supported by the brethren. Not that there are not any faithful men who are not being supported, but I'm saying... This is what it means. They accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. This means they reward those who teach this error. And those of us who do not teach error, we find out that there is no support for you. There's just controversy around you. And we don't want controversy. And we don't want trouble. And our friends don't like it. And our family was not didn't say that. They went there and they didn't tell me anything about that. See above. Whoever loves mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves brother or sister more than me is not worthy of me. What Jesus said, not what, uh, not what I said, this is what Jesus said. But that's how it goes in the churches. And I know from personal experience that that's how it goes. So where do they come from? They come from the desires of the people. It's what the people want. Beware compromise. Finally, how should we think about error? We let God define peace. We ask, what does God say about error in his word? So then what does it mean for you and me? How should we think about error? Well, I would say we have to make our own decision to stand firm. Second Timothy 4, 5, the apostle told the young evangelist, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your service. This is in the context of the fourth verse where he said he is about to die. Paul understands that Paul is about to die, and Timothy is going to have to carry on without him. That's a daunting task. But it's also the case that in observation today, you can see over and again, the pattern repeats itself, that there is a place that you think of, a congregation you think of as a sound congregation, full of faithful people, that has a faithful gospel preacher, somebody who is well-known, well-respected, who teaches all over the brotherhood, and his teaching is understood and known, is quite sound. You think to yourself, this congregation is must, is, must be very strong, but that guy dies, or that guy leaves. And what you see happen all too often is the brethren there don't know how to do anything. They don't know how to stand on their own two feet. They don't know how to lead 
services. They don't know how to teach the Bible. They don't know how to find somebody else who will. And that's sad. Because we're not supposed to have champions who go before us to fight our battles for us like the Israelites asked for a king. We're not supposed to be like that, but that's the temptation always. <laughs> so Paul is leaving and he says to Timothy, you be sober-minded, you endure suffering, you do the work of an evangelist. And there's a lesson in that for all of us, not just the evangelists. We all have to be the ones who are going to stand. You make a decision that, yes, I'm going to know what I need to know. I need to understand the things of God. Uh, Jude 3 is another example where we find, Beloved, though I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. It's a little bit subtle, but notice what he's saying. What he really wanted to do was to write about our common salvation. But that is not what he could do. Why not? Because it was necessary, he found, to appeal to you to contend for the faith. You're, if you're not contending for the faith, then salvation is not a thing you have in common with Jude and the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord. That's what he's saying. I wanted to write about our common salvation, but I found it necessary to appeal for you to contend. Not to be contentious, but to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We have the faith. We have the truth. Jude is written in retrospect of Second Peter. And it's very clear if you look at uh, the letters side by side that Jude uh, is closely based on Second Peter, but not just based on to write a book. What he's saying is, the apostles are gone, but their books are still here, and they still say what they said while, you know, the books still say what the apostles said while they were here. That's what Jude is all about. This is all about, hey guys, <laughs> the apostles are gone, but their words are not. We must do this. We must contend for this. The other thing that we find when it comes to how should we think about error is that we need to reject those who are in error. And I say reject people in error because not that in error we reject people <laughs> like it's a mistake, but no. Uh, reject the people who promulgate error. Um, so many times you'll hear this dodge about false teachings or he teaches this thing falsely. That's a dodge because they don't want to say that this person whom you know, whose name you know, whose family you know, who you grew up listening to is a false teacher. But Peter did not say in Second Peter 3 <laughs> or 2 rather that as there were false prophets among the people, so there will be false teachings among you. He said there will be false teachers among you. It is about people. Like it or not, I don't like it, but like it or not, it's about people. I used to think that, you know, I was wrong. I used to think that this was about, you know, the facts and the, the scriptures, but it is not. People are swayed in the churches by people, personalities, families that they have known more often than by the word itself. It is a shame and it shouldn't be that way, but it is that way. That's what's happening. So you got to understand the people who teach error, the people who support error, they are the problem. Error, yes, is a problem. We teach about the error. You go to the scriptures, but look, the problem is there are people whose hearts are not right, and you know them by their fruits. Romans 1.32 is an example, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. 
Yeah, it's one thing when uh, they themselves will do a thing that is wrong. Uh, another thing when they won't do it, but they'll approve of somebody else doing it. Um, I'm reminded of the, the preacher in Castleberry in Fort Worth who, not that long ago, I guess it was last year, about this time, was saying that uh, he could not condemn drinking alcohol anymore. Uh, but he was raised not drinking it and, you know, he was never going to and he was never going to take a drink, but that he, he was not one who was going to condemn you if you took a drink. It's Romans one thirty two. He knows, or should know, the righteous decree of God that people who practice such things deserve to die. Though he refuses to do it himself for traditional reasons, uh, cultural reasons, whatever, comfort level, personal opinions, none of those things have anything to do with God. He gives approval to those who practice them, and that is a problem. But it's just an example. Um, it's about the heart, you see, and what people want and what people want to do and what they're willing to support and go along with in order to get that. 2 John 9 through 11 is the last thing we look at today. Reject those who are in error. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching as both the Father and the Son, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him any greeting. Whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. So, Let's do a little bit of extra translation here. Uh, abide is remain inside of, or stay in bounds, really. So whoever goes ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ means whoever goes out of bounds, whoever leaves the field that is where Christ's teaching is, does not have God. Whoever stays within or inside of the boundaries of the teaching has both Father and Son. If anybody comes to you and does not bring this teaching, what teaching? That's one of my favorite quibbles. What teaching? The teaching of Christ? Well, yes, obviously. But they will say, well, no, this teaching about whether you abide in the Son. <laughs> obviously not what it's about. People are just arguing to argue sometimes. But it comes from the heart where they believe sincerely that you cannot understand the Bible. If they come and don't bring this teaching, don't receive them into the house, don't give them a greeting. Which is to say, give him a greeting means say hello. <laughs> Whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Meaning to welcome him, to make him feel comfortable. I'm reminded of people, these people are long gone, but there was a man who was well-known, well-respected. His teaching was spread all over the place. If I said his name, you would know his name. It doesn't matter because he's gone and I'm not trying to make any point about his influence in particular. But there was another man who was a known false teacher. The first man would never have the known false teacher to hold a, a meeting in the congregation where he preaches. He never would. But when the unfaithful churches in the same town had that man come hold a meeting, he stayed with the first preacher. When somebody <clears throat> asked him, hey, isn't that guy a false teacher? Well, yes. Well, so why are you letting him stay in your house when he comes to town? He said, well, you got to understand, we are very old friends. Oh, well then, that means everything Jesus said doesn't matter, right? <laughs> Wrong. He shouldn't have done that because of Second John 9 through 11. You don't go along and make people feel like they're okay when they are not okay. And we don't mean somebody is overtaken in a trespass. We mean somebody who is teaching, teaching error, causing other people to be lost. Don't receive that one into your house. Don't give that one any encouragement in the wrong that he is doing. 
we have to be willing to take that stand, to draw that line and say, no, no, that is not right. I'm not going to pretend like that is right. Yeah, I love you. Yeah, you, you, you're my friend, but I, because you're my friend, I can't let you do this. So that is, <clears throat> to my thinking, how we ought to think, oops, how we ought to think about error. There's something wrong there, sorry. But the lesson's over. The scriptures on doctrinal error. I felt like it was necessary to lay out these verses. We'll get into more detail about some things, the Lord willing. But I felt like it was necessary to lay out these verses in a lesson and let you have some of the principles as we get further into this and do name some names and do read some things that have been written by people in the churches today, some of whom are still alive. I realize a lot of them are gone, but uh, their teaching's not gone. The churches have not changed um, from the mistake of listening to them. The fact is that uh, even if these people are gone, it really is not about these individuals. It's about what happened and how it happened and what it means for us. I said before that this is more about people than it is about facts, and that is true. I think about Romans uh, 14 error, for example, that was taught for a long time and that was wrestled over in the 80s and in the 90s to a great degree, and you're familiar with that if you were a Christian at that time, probably. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, it probably means you went to one of the places that was on the wrong side of that issue. But there was a lot of study about Romans 14 and how it should be interpreted. The words that were in there, the sequence and the grammar, the structure of it, the contents of it, there was a lot of study put towards understanding that passage, which is fine. It's always good to know and understand what the Bible teaches. But that was misguided because it was chasing this falsehood that God's word was not understood. That's not the problem. Romans 14 is perfectly clear. There's no problem understanding what it means. The problem is that brethren want to have fellowship with Homer Haley, who openly taught error on marriage and divorce, and they had to find some way to do that. So they twisted something somewhere to make it possible. It wasn't because they didn't understand Romans 14. It wasn't because they were reading the Bible. They came up to this chapter and said, oh, look at this. I've been wrong all my life. I should be allowing Homer Haley to continue to hold meetings with us, even though he teaches error. If only I had read this passage before. No, that didn't happen. That never happened. It never does happen. It was never about that, is what I'm saying. Not that the teaching about Romans 14 was bad, or that exposing it and, and showing the, the verses and how it's understood is a bad thing. It's always good to teach the Bible. But don't believe that the problem is people's inability to understand or failure to understand what it says. Yeah, you start there, you do some teaching there, but it becomes clear fairly quickly that people believe what they want to believe. They have itching ears and heap up for themselves teachers according to their own desires. That's what I'm getting at. The bottom line for them was you cannot understand the Bible alike. So we have to come up with some other way to have fellowship and to define the boundaries of Christian unity. That's what it's really about. Not about whether they understood Romans 14 or any of the other things we'll talk about. It's really about can the Bible be understood or not. They believe not. But it's clear the scriptures can be understood. And they must be understood, and we'll be judged for the things that are written there, whether we have done them or not. We'll be judged for the things done in the body, whether they are good or whether they are evil. 
Today, if you are not a Christian, obey the gospel of Jesus. Repent of sins. Prepare for the judgment day by becoming a Christian. Being buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins. Yes, the water is what God commands, that you be buried, that you be dunked underneath, that you might come up from the water, a new creature, a new creation in God. That is where the blood of Jesus washes away every sin. Today, if you are already a Christian but have not lived right, repent as well. But let us pray for you that you might be helped, because we also face temptation. If today you need our prayers or you need to be baptized, let your need be known. Coming to the front as we stand and sing.